All right, here we go. Today we have legendary Baltimore street figure Rudy Williams, once dubbed a super kingpin by law enforcement. In fact, David Simon, uh, the creator of The Wire, once wrote a major article comparing your time on the street to England's King Richard III, who's considered one of the bloodiest kings of all time. At one point, you were sentenced to life plus 130 years by the feds in the 90s, but now you're out after serving 31 years. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, this is your first time here, so I want to start in the very beginning. So you were born in the 50s. 54. And uh, you actually grew up in a stable two-parent household. True. Yep. Uh, both of your parents worked. Um, what kind of jobs did your mom and dad have uh, during that time when you were a kid? I can't remember exactly what my mother had, but uh, my father was a, a truck driver. Okay. Um, and there was eight kids all together, right? Right. And, you know, you guys, you know, were, you know, struggling with so many kids, but, you know, you guys still made ends meet, and growing up, you didn't really feel like you were poor. No, I did. Okay. Um, but then at one point, uh, at age 13, you started getting in trouble. Yeah, I was getting in trouble before 13. I, 13 is when I got punished for getting in trouble. I was sentenced to a boy's village. Okay, that's a juvenile facility. Right. Okay, and what actually did you do to get sentenced? Truancy. Not wanting to go to school. Okay. So relatively minor stuff. Right. Okay. But once you actually got into this, uh, into this juvenile program, uh, you know, everyone else in there were there for rougher things. True. Mostly, so, so mostly what, everyone. Yeah. Okay. So what started to happen once you actually got in that system? Well, uh, let me go in detail. I remember uh, it was a shock, you know, because uh, the judge had, I had been to court like five or six times for truancy, and each time I was sent home. But this time, I remember the judge saying, you know, I don't know what to do. He told my mother that, uh, you know, he's been in front of me like five or six times. You know, he's been warned, you know, he's still continue to hook school, so uh, I don't know what to do, you know? The only thing I can think of is to send him away, you know? And uh, my mother kind of agreed with that, right? So they, uh, they decided to send me to uh, Boys Village for a third-day commitment, you know, depending on my behavior. If I do good, I can go home after 30 days. If not, then I'll stay longer, you know? And, uh, so after the after the uh, court session, he took me up in a bullpen. It was like five or six other little boys in there waiting to go to Boys Village. They allowed my mother to come in, you know, and I was really hurt. And I wanted to cry, but the most I could do was a couple of snick snipples. Okay, so now you're in the system. And I think you compared it almost to like crime school once you actually got in there. Right, right. It was like a crime school. You know, at that age, we brag on what we uh, locked up for. It was sort of like an accomplishment. You know? Okay. So then you come in as a, as a petty criminal, you know, just not going to school. But then when you get out, at that point, you become a real criminal? Yeah, I graduated, you could say that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what type of things were you doing once you got out? I was still a car doing burglaries and basically robbing other little kids with their lunch money on their way to school. Uh, we were hopping buses. Now, I was doing that before, prior to that. I was doing that before, you know. Um, I mean, we was doing a uh, little bit of everything. 
Well, when you went in, you know, both your parents were in the house, but I guess when you got out, your dad ended up uh, divorcing your mom and leaving the house, right? Not that time, no. Oh, that came later? Yeah, that came later when I was about 16, 17 years old. Okay. And, and I guess, you know, your dad just was having a hard time trying to support eight kids and, and really feel like a man, you know, while doing it, so he just ended up leaving? No, uh, he got put out, you know, basically. Oh, he did? Okay. Yeah. My mother and father was divorced. He got put out. You know. Okay. How much strain did that put on your family when now the man of the house is gone? Well, I wasn't there when that happened. When that happened, I was up, uh, let me see. I maybe was up uh, Victor Cullen. So I wasn't in the house to be aware of that. Even when I was home, I really wasn't aware of what was going on, you know. Because I, I was always in the street, you know, running. Well, uh, I mean, during that time, heroin was prominent um, in Baltimore. True. The first time I so, seen somebody shoot, shoot heroin was... Uh, I think it was like 69. Okay. Dude, dude named Bobby Lil John was in the back alley. You know, we was walking up the alley. And I seen him in the back alley tying a shoe screen to his arm and pushing a needle in his arm, you know. Well, you yourself, at what point did you start dabbling in that in terms of selling? I'll say around the same time. Shortly. Okay, after. so you were like what, 14, 15 years old? No, I was uh, about 16. Okay. All right, so 16 years old and you start uh, dealing heroin, I'm sure at a, at a very low level in the beginning? True. We okay, but when, when you talk about, so, sorry, go ahead. We were, we were robbing oh, drug dealers. We was robbing drug dealers, and I didn't use uh, heroin, so I would take my cut and sell it. You know? Okay. I mean, robbing drug dealers is a pretty dangerous job. Yeah, it was pretty dangerous. All right. What, what was the craziest situation you had while trying to do that? Oh, let me see here. Well, a guy, a guy refused to give it up, give up the drugs, and he had to be pistol whipped and shot. You know. Not saying I shot him, I was. <laughs> okay. Uh, so that graduates to you actually getting more and more heroin yourself on your own, as opposed to just robbing drug dealers. Yeah, uh, my career was kind of interrupted. I started saving money, and I stopped robbing drug dealers and became a drug dealer myself at the age of, like, 16. And what happened, and uh, I ended up getting a manslaughter charge and went away, uh, I think, was... 71, early 70. And I was gone for like 10 and a half years. What exactly was the situation that got you the manslaughter charge? It was, the, it was uh, involving uh, drugs. It was involving drugs. It was a transaction that went bad. And the guy went for a gun, you know, and I had a gun, you know, you know. He ended up uh, dead, you know. I, I was 17 at the time. He was uh, about the same age I was. How did it feel, 17 years old, to, to have a dead body in front of you and knowing that, okay, you know, the worst, you know, I might get life in prison. I, I, I don't know if there was a death penalty at one point. You know, do you go on the run? What exactly do you do as these thoughts are going through your head? 
I went on a run for maybe a month. Went on a run. I didn't think about, I would think about getting away, you know. At that age, you don't think about, you don't think about the consequences too much you know, or what you did. Okay, so eventually you get caught and they give you 11 years. True, yeah. Now, actually, while you're locked actually, up- Actually, they gave me five years. I want to back up a little bit. They gave me five years for manslaughter. Ah, okay. So where did the other six years come from? While I was in, I did 11 years. While I was in, I got, uh, let me see, uh, 10 years for uh, stabbing another prisoner. Then I got three years for stabbing a lieutenant at Protection Institution. Okay. Now, while you're locked up, you're actually locked up with George Jackson. Yeah, George Jackson. George Jackson, uh, who is the founder of the Black Gorilla family. True. So George Jackson has a very, a very interesting story. So I guess he was locked up for doing armed robbery back in 61. Uh, but then in 1970, him along with two other guys in Soledad ended up killing a correctional officer uh, after a prison fight. And then he wrote a book that same year called Soledad Brother, the prison letters of George Jackson, and it became a bestseller. Right. So he was kind of a, a celebrity in the prison. Called celebrity. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about George Jackson. Well, I came to know about George Jackson uh, when I was, uh, I think, 17. I was at the city jail for the manslaughter charge. They put me in a cell with a uh, guy that was a couple years older than they handy, 19. And he had the book. They put me in a cell with him. He was telling me about George Jackson. He was, he was uh, practicing uh, getting ready for the revolution. He was eating bread, water. And he would come out on the tear, you know, and try to politicize the brothers and and he was actually started incidents over there. So at that time, right, it didn't make a big impact on me. I think it may be a year later, I was at Hagerstown, and I started reading them. I came across the book again, I started reading it. Okay. And I mean, you actually said that while you were young, this was the single most important person in your life. True. That's true. Okay. But then in 1971, I guess uh, George Jackson tried to escape from prison. And um, I guess they had taken a bunch of hostages, like five hostages. And in the process, he ended up getting killed. Right. And uh, I guess they found five dead hostages, hostages in a cell after it was all said and done. Three inmates and two COs. Okay, were you locked up during this riot and this this escape with him? No, I wasn't locked up with him. He was in L.A. I was in the Baltimore. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, okay, this you was guys like were a year person, later. So. Yeah, this was a year later. You know. Okay, I understand. Um, when you heard the news, what'd you think? No, I learned about George after he was dead. He was already dead when I learned about him. Oh, okay, got it. So you never actually met him. I think maybe his, his brother Jonathan died a year earlier than he did, right? Okay. But the reason I was impressed by George, George was a extraordinary leader. He transformed himself from a street criminal into someone who had the knowledge of a professor. You know? To me, he, he was like, he had like the most complex and extraordinary he was a genius, mine, uh, for his age, you know, of any of the black leaders during that time period. And he yeah, did, I mean, very, very interesting figure, absolutely. He impacted, uh, uh, he impacted the world from inside of prison pretty much 
on the level of a Malcolm X or Martin Luther King to me. He might not be as well known to some people, but his mind was more advanced. There you have it. There you have it. So after 10 and a half years, you get out and now you're back in Baltimore. Um, do you go back to crime right away or do you try to do the, the regular nine to five thing? Oh, I'm back. Uh, I pretty much went in, I, I worked, but I, had, I went into crime within months. I had planned to go into crime. You know. Up until uh, the, the 10 and a half years, I was pretty much, you know, devoted my life to my people, to the revolution, not just my people, but all people, which is white, black, red, you know. And I was convinced, you know, that uh, the American capitalist system, you know, was was an inferior system to a socialism. You know, it wasn't a system, you know, that to meet the people's uh, need, poor people. You know. It was a rich man system, you know that exploit, took advantage, and robbed people. You know? And I was being a person that was always protected of other people, you know, I felt like it was injustice, and I felt like, you know, I wanted to do something about it. So it was my mission. But during the time of incarceration, everybody that I talked to tried to uh, get to see a change. They told me that, you know, that it wasn't possible, and the revolution was dead, and don't nobody want to hear that. And I mean, every kind of excuse in the world, you know. George Jackson was dead, Angela was locked up, Hurry on the run, Malcolm dead, Martin Luther King dead, all these excuses and all. You know, and I used to say, well, I ain't, I'm not dead, you know. Now what? what? What kind of excuse you got now, you know? But I got resistance all the way through, so, and I wouldn't hear anything, you know. And say two years before I came home in 82, I opened my mind, you know, and started thinking, well, maybe they right, you know. Suppose they are right. You find out they're right when you get out there. What you gonna do? You know? So I'm angry because I didn't want to accept that they were right. To me, they just didn't want to do anything about their lives. And so I'm angry, you know, and I'm saying, if they are right, then I'm saying, fuck them. When I get out, I'm gonna get mine. Anybody get my way, I'm not letting anything stop me, you know. And that was my mindset when I came home. Now, when you got out, was little Melvin still on the street? Yeah, I think he was on the street at the time. Okay. I actually met him once uh, a couple of years before he passed. You know, we, we went out to Baltimore. We, we met up with him. Uh, very interesting guy. Very, very intelligent. You know, had a couple of conversations with him. Very, very insightful. I still remember all, everything we talked about. Um, were you doing business with him at all or was he completely different from what you were doing? No, we was a, like parallel, you know. I would run into him. we speak and all that. We never really, really associated or had. By, by the way, though, I was just at a birthday party. Uh, when was it? Uh, I think it was Friday. His daughter's birthday party. Hmm. I had a pretty good time, too, you know. Very cool. Uh, rest in peace, little Melvin. Um, now, did you get married after you got out of, uh, out of prison? Yeah. Okay. It was in um I got out in the, yeah. Got married in eighty nine. Okay. So so you get out and and now you get back on the street and what what year is this once you're out of prison after that uh, eleven year term? Eighty two. Eighty two. Okay. So at that point it's still it's still heroin. Crack hadn't really arrived yet in Baltimore? No, it was heroin at the time. I think crack arrived around 85. That's when I heard about it, around 85, okay. 85 something like that. 
So you're building up a heroin operation uh, in Baltimore, and and it starts to grow over over a number of years. Um, how big did it get at its height? At its height, I would say it was pretty international. I would say it was pretty big. Okay, because there was a it was an article that I read. Uh, where I guess supply was coming from Africa, the Middle East, Latin America, Europe. Yeah, At least that's, that's what they said. That's true. Okay. And were you actually going overseas as well? Yeah, I was. Okay. Which countries did you go to? I've been to uh, Kenya, Nigeria. Aha. Uh-huh. London, Paris. Puerto Rico. Okay. I mean, does it get kind of dicey out there and dangerous meeting up with guys on their own, you know, in a different country on their own terrain, you know, that you're not familiar with? No, no, that's in the movies, not on that level, you know. That's in the movies and all that. You know, the movies got to be exciting, but most of the time on that level, you're dealing with uh, very trustworthy people, you know. Well, uh, in 1987, there was a there was, I guess, a situation where the police pulled you over, and they found a machine gun and a bulletproof vest, and I guess they said they they found a gram of heroin as well, which wasn't yours. No, that wasn't mine. Okay, well, what happened in that situation? Okay, uh, I just got back in town from New York. My wife lived in uh, Long Island, and. I get a call from one of my people, and they uh, they upset. They upset on the phone. They Rudy, Rudy, you got. I need a Uzi. You got. I need a Uzi. I need some machine guns. You know. Do you have any? I was like, yeah, but what's the problem? You know. He says, my uh, girlfriend brother. He he stole my drugs. He's got all of them. You know, and. Uh, I need them, I'm gonna go get them, you know. So this had been like the second time in a row, you know, that this guy got some type of excuse, you know, and not the money, you know. So I said to myself, I'm gonna go. I told him, I'm gonna go with you, you know. But I didn't tell him, you know, I had in mind that if uh, I'm gonna find out really what happened, if he's lying, he's in trouble, if he's telling the truth, somebody else is in trouble. But I'm, you know, I'm tired of it at the time. So uh, I made a few calls. About three calls arrived, you know, with the guns and all that. We goes down to the project, I think with the Mercy Homes. And I'm not thinking right, you know. So I'm, I'm just like, wanting to get to the bottom of it, you know? So, so we pull up, we like in three cars. As soon as we pull up, this car come down the street. It's a white man in the car. We know it's an undercover car. And we know that he gotta be the police. At the Murphy Homes that time of night, like 12 or something. So I see him and I tell him, I was like, oh, we can't do nothing there. We gotta get out of here. So everybody started getting back in the car, take off. The car was in a BMW, my girlfriend's car, not my wife's car, but my old girlfriend. She had just got a new key, but the key wasn't broken in yet. My man was driving, I wasn't driving. So he's struggling with the key. Everybody else is gone, you know time he started up the car and we take off, they hit us, boom, boom, boom. About 15 police cars, blue and white. Get out the car, get out the car, you know. And they get us out the car. They found the gun, bulletproof vest, and they locked us up. I think I had like maybe $1,300 in my pocket. And they counted it, gave it back, Counted, gave it back, counted. Then the officer say, let me count that one more time because I don't want you to complain that anything is missing. 
you know, he said, I'm going to count it one time. He, he counts it. He get ready to give it back. And another officer come in the room and said, no, he don't get that back. We frown hard run in the car. Okay. I mean, were there a lot of dirty cops during that time? I haven't experienced any. Or had too much knowledge of them. No, I don't think so. Well, I mean, one cop in particular uh, had it out for you, it seems, which was uh, Baltimore police detective Ed Burns, who was actually the co-creator of The Wire. True. Ed Burns at the time was a homicide detective. Him and Harry Edgerton, they was assigned to me for years. And they always came up empty-handed. So ultimately, they went over to the feds and joined forces with them, and they became part of an organized task force. Get Rudy Williams. Whatever you do, just get him. Okay. So he was after you for a while. And I guess there was a, there was a situation where there was a major case that you had, which you ended up beating? Yeah, my last state case was against... Uh, Stuart Sims, the head prosecutor of Baltimore City. A Rose Scholar, All-American athlete, All-American student, ex-federal prosecutor, best friend of the mayor, Kurt Smoke at the time. Okay, so you, you're running this, this operation in Baltimore. You beat a major case. And then in 1992, this article comes out, uh, which is actually written by David Simon, who was the creator uh, and head writer of The Wire. Right. So in that article, he compared you to King Richard III of England, who two-year reign during the 1400s was considered a bloodbath, ultimately considered the, the bloodiest um, you know, king of all time. Um, in that article, he, he said that you were responsible for six murders. Um, and I guess during that time, there were rumors that, you know, you had killed up to 200 people. Yeah. That was the rumors. That was the rumors. <laughs> okay. So when that article came out and you first read it, what'd you think? Um... Uh, I found it very funny. It was interesting, you know. And at the time, David Simon had just written a book called Homicide, I think. And he was basically, as a writer, cutting his teeth, you know. So he uh, he uh, indulged uh, uh, or he engaged in poetic license very heavily, yep. Oh, okay. But when that article came out, it kind of, created a big effect in Baltimore in terms of the media and, you know, pressure on the police and the prosecutors and everything, right? True. I think it came out after uh, I got my sentence. I'm not, I'm not sure what it came before or after, you know. Okay. And I guess, you know, later on, you fast forward years later, uh, there was a whole plot line in The Wire uh, where, like, Marlo Stanfield was caught, you know, stealing something from a store, and then he had the, the security guard uh, killed, and he claimed that that was based on one of your stories. True. Okay, but you said that nothing like that ever happened. No, not like that. I remember uh, being in the market, and an uh, incident took place, right? My wife and uh, her sister is from Long Island, I was in the car with my two sons. They were just gonna run in there and grab something to cook for the moment. And my wife runs back out, you know, tells me to come in the market. She wanted me to uh, see this guy, you know, that was in my sister-in-law's face, you know. And, and it got into it and all. So we leave, you know. I leave. And as far as I know, that was that. 
understand uh, uh, later on from the rumors and the papers that uh, that the officer was uh, killed like a month later or something like that. But uh, they blame everything on me anyway. That when they can't solve a murder in Baltimore, they was in the habit of blaming it on me. You know? Well, right. I mean, like I said earlier, they were saying that you're responsible for 200 murders in Baltimore. 200. Yeah, that's that, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Okay. So then, was it 1995 where you get arrested uh, and charged with the the kilos? 95. Uh, no, 95, I was arrested and charged with actually uh, four murders and two murder conspiracy, temp murder, and, and a whole gang of uh, firearms. And stuff. No, that was, okay, what happened? Yeah, that was 95. January. Okay. So was that was, was that the case you were convicted for or no? No, no, I was acquitted on all. Okay. So, but there was a situation where you were charged with trafficking thirty kilos of heroin. Yeah, that was uh, that was a ninety. When I was arrested, April seventeenth, ninety. Okay. So, so which which case was it when you were ultimately convicted? What what year was that? That was the case. That was a federal one. Okay, got it. Okay, so so in that case, you were charged with trafficking 30 kilos of heroin with a street value of $10 million. And at that point, the law enforcement was calling you a super kingpin. True. Now, I had never heard that term before or after. What exactly did they say is a super kingpin? The definition of a super kingpin is someone who sells 15 keys of heroin or earn $10 million within, what, two years or something like that. Okay. So you get charged with that, and I guess they gave you a 35-year plea deal? Yeah, they offered me one, yeah. I, t- I okay. declined it, of course. So you declined the plea deal, and you decided to take it to trial. Right. Were you given a bail at that point, or are you sitting in, in no, jail no waiting bail. for the trial? No, no bail. bail. Part of okay. that part of that strategy was to keep me in jail, so they can uh, persuade people to uh, testify against me. If I'm in jail behind bars, they can run around Baltimore City and have their way. You know, if I'm on the street, they, the investigation don't go anywhere. You know? How long were you locked up waiting for trial? Uh, About 13, 14 months. Okay, over a year. Yeah, and the question is why, you know, so long. Since we're supposed to have a speedy trial, you know, within six months. The question is why, and I'll tell you why. Because they didn't have a case against me in this. They didn't have a case. They never do have cases. They make these big drug buses and they put guys behind jail and that's when they get their case because a lot of guys can't hold water. And they start talking and telling them and they turn them against each other, you know. Then they have a case, you know. They thought they had a case against me. You know? They watching me, following me. Well, uh, how many people end up testifying against you? Uh, civilians, non-police witnesses, I would say maybe 10. And out of them 10, they were mostly foreigners. They were not uh, local Baltimoreans, people that I knew. These were people that was, in other cases, trying to go home, trying to earn a, get out of jail free card from the federal government. And, but people actually, I know it wasn't, I mean, it was maybe like three, you know, people that got on okay. stand to testify. So three people that were close to you ended up turning on you. Yeah, they wasn't even close to me. 
Nobody that was close to me turned. Okay. These were people that knew me. You know. Well, you know, once the trial began, uh, you were actually pretty uh, belligerent towards the judge. Yeah. Uh, we got into it. I guess at one it. point, yeah, I guess uh, you said, fuck you again, judge, during the trial? Yeah, I did. Because the judge was a bully, okay. intellectual punk, and he was disrespectful to my lawyers, my co defendants' lawyers. He wouldn't let them talk. He let the prosecutors do all the talk, you know. And I seen what was going down, you know, and I, and I fight back. You hit me, I'll fight you back. I don't take no ass whippers. Yeah, I mean, people don't usually tell the judge to go fuck themselves during trial, but, yeah, you did what you did. I mean, they was railroading us, uh, Black. They was railroading us. They was making the case up as we go along. They didn't have a case. You know? I know the I know the laws and the rules on it. Judge was bending every rule in the book. They wasn't playing fair, you know. Well, uh, by the end of the trial, you you called the judge your lordship of this great star chamber of injustice. Then you said, by no stretch of anyone's imagination did I receive a fair trial, nor an honest or decent one because God has given me the sense, dignity, and courage to decline the government's perverted plea bargain of 35 years and the strength to stand up to this persecution. Your end has been from the very beginning to put me in prison for life. Yeah, from day one. They were. You were found guilty of seven drug-related charges and an eighth uh, federal conspiracy charge. And mm -hmm. you were given life in prison plus 130 years. Mm-hmm. You're how old at this time? I think I was like 36 at the time. How does a 36-year-old get life plus 130 years around their head? Mm -hmm. Like how 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 do you how do you get that? How do you deal with that? It's like you uh, you play the hand you dealt, you know. Play the hand. I I felt like I was gonna come back. Eventually, I ain't know how at the time, you know, but even false hope was better than no hope. I learned that one. Because uh, I had to place my hope on uh, plans that totally blow up in my face, but I still won because you know, I kept fighting. Right. And your wife originally was charged, but she ended up getting acquitted. Yeah, she got acquitted. At any point, did they say, hey, listen, um, cooperate with us against these guys here and we'll make this go away. We'll put you in witness protection. We'll change your name and you could live out the rest of your life. No, they man. never talked to me. They never talked. They, they sent a deal to me through my lawyer, but they never even tried to talk to me. Because... Okay. Well, uh, ultimately... You end up getting uh, life plus 130 years, and then you got sent to Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary. Yeah, that was my first stop. Yeah. You ended up doing 31 years in prison. 31. During those 31 years, what do you think was the most violent things that you experienced? Did I experience or did I see or observe? Well, let's start with what you saw. I saw, uh, in Lewisburg, I saw at least, uh, when I was there, two years. I saw at least uh, 17, 18 murders. Wow. 17, I saw that many, and I, I heard the other ones, you know, in other parts of the jail that I didn't see. Okay. How many different prisons did you get transferred to during those 31 years? Hmm. I'm going to say right off about maybe 10. Okay. Close so to every 10. three years or so, they would just put you somewhere else? 
Yeah, I stayed in a couple places. Like, I maybe the longest place was Allenwood for eight years. Well, what was the most violent thing that you were involved in yourself? I had one incident in the entire time. I think I had like maybe 11 or 12 years in. And I was working in the library, doing nothing, was sitting down. I had a sanitation job, but I wasn't cleaning up for uh, five hours a month or something like that. That's what they paid you. And so I was just going to the library, you know, sit, read books. The young dudes come in. It was like a school, university, Harvard or something, you know. Any subject you can imagine, you know, we could talk about. And it was a guy working in there. He worked behind the, the counter where the magazines and the books are, you know. And I could go pretty much and get a book. It didn't have to, you actually have to show your ID to get a book. Give him your ID while you have the book. And then when you return the book, he give it back. But I never had to give him my ID. To one day, I go get a book after maybe, what, two years. He asked me for an ID, and I'm like, oh, I got to show ID now? He said, yeah, you've been here long enough. You know, you know what you got to do. So I said, you know what? Keep this magazine on. And he started mouthing off, mouthing off and all that. And I told him, go ahead. And uh, this is the same guy that I stopped somebody from jumping it. But he was a big guy, close to 300 pounds, lifting up all the weights. And what was happening, let me give you a little background. He had two new guys working in the library. He was assigned to uh, teach them the ropes. And... So he was enforcing it all of a sudden, you know, which I didn't know at the time. And he showed them you had to be tough to hold down his position. You know. So he started mouthing off, right? So I told him, I was like, man, get out of my face, punk. And he was like, I'm a punk. So what you want to do? You know, whatever you want to do. So he invited me into the uh, men's room, the restroom. So I go in there with him. We get in there, he started talking. He was like, look, man, I'm too big for you. If we get into it, you know, I will hurt you, you know. And I was like, you ain't gonna do anything to me. Looked him dead in the eye, you, you ain't gonna do anything to me, you's a punk. He was like, look, man, I'll hurt you and all. It's like, man, what, I'm not gonna hit him first because he's 300 pounds. You know? If he hit me, I'm gonna fight him, but I'm not backing down, right? I looked him in the eye, let him know you ain't gonna do anything to me. Yeah. So he wanted to talk and talk and talk. He wanted to convince me, you know, what would happen if we get if we got into it, you know, which I don't care about that. That's just the first stage. You gotta worry about the next stage. All right. So he talking and talking and all. I see he's not going to do anything. So I walked out. I went anyway. Like he's 300 pounds. I'm 150 pounds, 60. You know? So I went. I don't have to do anything to him. You know? I went. You know, I took his heart. Get out of my face. He follows me back out to the table, sit down next to me, and still want to carry on the conversation. He don't understand what's wrong with me. You know, he's twice my size. And he can't convince me, you know, that I don't want to fight him, you know. And at this time, I'm like, I'm like, I'm through talking, you know, because talk, I don't believe in words anyway, you know. All right. You're not going to convince me and I'm not going to convince you, you know. So I tried to give him a pass. He wouldn't take it. You know? So 4 o'clock, we goes back to the... Uh, to the housing unit. I'm in mean, 4A at the time. They do a camp. They let us back out. I'm in my room. Somebody come to the room. 
Say, look, Rudy, about four or five of your young homies out at the door. They say, come to the door. I go to the door. They was like, what's up, man? You beefing with somebody over in the school? No, I said, yeah, we had some words. What you want to do? You want us to kill him or what? You know? I said, no, nah, I don't want y'all to kill him. I said, if I wanted y'all to do that, I'll do it myself. You know? I wouldn't send y'all to do that. You know? All right. Well, what you want to do? You know? I said, I ain't really decided right now. You know? they, and uh, so I said, look, we can go back over there. I'm going to trick him in the bathroom, you know? And y'all stay back, you know? I'm going to see if I can trick him in the bathrooms. So we go back over there to the library. And he's behind the counter. I walked behind the counter, snatched a magazine, right? So he come up to me. They hiding. <laughs> he come up to me. It's like, what you doing? What it look like I'm doing, man? See, you can't touch the magazine. He tried to get it out my hand. You know, I hit him. And we gone. So, uh, so we, we tussling, knocking over bookshelves, books flying everywhere and all that. 300 pound dude, he grabs me, he's trying to throw me, right? But I'm holding on. In my mind, I'm saying, damn, I told them to give me three minutes. I know that three minutes is up with my backup. <laughs> so I'm like, where my backup at? Just like, we. It's, you know, it seemed like a long time. You know, I'm thinking it's been like 15 minutes we tussling in there, you know. So finally they come in, grab him. He don't know they with me, you know. They start grabbing real raw, pushing him and all. He was like, no, he, he swung on me first. He hit me first, you know. And uh, he was trying to explain the situation, right? So we left. We left and we go to the basketball court. Now it's like 30 guys out of Baltimore, and they got knives, and they want to go back. So I'm saying, no, no. So they were saying, like, you stay out the way. You know, we can get in when they call the, uh, the end of the move and everybody go back, you know, and I was like, no, nah, that's a ride situation. Plus, they got a towel. They shoot down there, you know, no. Nah. They said, well, all right, we can get them tomorrow morning, you know, when they in bed. When they open the doors up, no, we're going to run in there. I was like, no, you know, I'm not sending these dudes on a, a suicide mission because they're killing me. They're never getting out of jail. All right. So they was like, we got to do something to them. They're looking at my face. I got a, some scratches and all this on my face. They pissed off, you know. We, we can't let them get away with that, you know. All right. Because really, you know, when you talk about me, you're not talking about the individuals. You're talking about Baltimore. It wasn't so much me, you know. I mean, they love me too, right? But it was also, you know, the status thing, you know, right? You hit the legend in Baltimore. You can't do that. You know, that's like pissing on the cross or something, you know. A Christian, you know. And uh, the Quran, if you're Muslim, you know. So, man, they decided... And they got knives on him. I was like, okay, we just fuck him up. It's enough for us to fuck him up, you know. So they uh they got knives, so I was like, nah, you can't take these knives and all. I've seen guys start out, you know, with a limited mission, they call it mission creep. The guy end up dead, you know. So I said, nah, you're gonna leave them knives. No, nah, we ain't gonna stab them and all that. We were just gonna have them. I was like, nah, you're gonna leave them knives and shit out here. Get that to somebody else. So we finally go back up there, you know. And now I tell them to go first, because if he see me coming, he know what it is. I tell, send like about seven of them up there, and we go up in there, man, we fucked him up. We give him a, a damn near new face and all, beat him in the ear with typewriters and everything. They call the deuces, which is the code, you know, a mercy code. We hear keys and all that, feet running. So I'm like, I'm going to get out of here. I like to get away with shit. You know, when I do something, I don't do anything emotional. If I have, I probably don't have to. So uh, so they running. We hear the keys. We try and get out the library. But it was like four of them that was bloodthirsty. They got a taste of blood. 
and they was out of control, you know. So they got caught up in there. They take them to the uh, hole and they say, look, he would take the weight. We don't want to go out there and lock everybody up, you know. If he would take the weight, uh, we're going to go get Rudy. And they had me on camera, jumping over the camera, you know. And they said, well, all right. When they said that, they was like, okay, we'll take the weight, you know. So they went. And they, what happened was it was a dude that he had a reputation for uh, being a bully, running his mouth. Investigation, which is called the SIS, they knew about it. And so they left me out there. Like three, four months later, I think it was around Christmas time, they get out the hole. I see them, they come in there in a compound, they smile, and you know, it's like heroes coming back home from the war, you know. Well, you got sentenced, like I said, to life plus 130 years. How did you get out after 31 years? How did I get out? Exactly. Uh, in 2015, they changed the law, the law, the, the amount of time you can get for drugs. When I, uh, when I came through my trial, you can get a level 38, which 38. If you got maybe two other points, 40, they can give you a discretionary life sentence if it's on the judge. But if you get a 44 like they gave me, you get automatic like life sentence. No questions asked. So they got me up to a level 38. And they changed that in 2015, like I said. And it was retroactive, meaning that it applied to people that came before then, such as myself. At the time, they drew up a list because they keep statistics on everything. So they knew exactly who was sentenced under that. And they drew up a list. And somehow my name was left off the list. 2015, my name was left off the list. So when they changed the law to compassionate uh, release, for COVID and all that in 20, what, 2020, I filed, you know. They gave me a lawyer, and the lawyer was looking at, and I mentioned that to them, you know, about the points and a couple other things. And they was like, oh, yeah, you eligible. You should have been out five years ago. You know, they filed a emergency, emergency motion and got it in front of the judge. Even though it was an emergency motion, it still took me eight months to get home, but I'm home now. How did it feel to walk out of that prison after 31 years? I mean, you go in in your 30s, <laughs> you come out in your 60s. Yeah, I mean, it was unbelievable, man. Because at times, man, at times, man, you can lose track of reality in prison. The prison is a box, and the cell is a box within a box. And that might be the extent of your, your uh, stimuli, you know, information you take. And we watch the news all the time, TV and all that. But sometimes when you're in that cell by yourself and you're looking at four walls, you can damn near reach out with your arms and touch them. You start to lose contact with reality. You know, you like, you wonder, you know, even though I kept up the stance and, and I never let on otherwise to anybody, you know, about me not coming home. But at times, man, and you got a license in 130 years, at times, yeah, I actually wonder, you know, for moments and all. But most of the time, I was determined that I was going to get out one way or another, you know. When you went back to Baltimore and you, you got a chance to walk around your own neighborhoods and so forth, was it about the same, better, or worse? Uh, it was it was the same and not the same, really, you know. 
you're talking about physical uh, layout. Uh, actually, it was a lot of more trees than uh, trees everywhere. You know, I'm, I'm riding in other people's cars and really talking and not paying attention. So I could be in my old neighborhood around the corner and not know it and not know, you know. So it was a lot of trees and a lot of positions, you know, that restaurants or any government position like the DMV and places like that, you know, it's a lot more black people, you know, that was uh, man in these positions. Well, uh, how many years, when you look at the amount of time that you were, you know, you had your drug operation and you were making money and living the life and, and bawling out. How many years did you get before you ended up getting your 31 years? How many years did I do or did I get? No, uh, no. How, how many years did you get to enjoy life to the fullest? Before I got know, to 31 years? outside years? the law. I would before say Before like, you did your 31 years, how many years did you get to ball out, basically? Oh, uh, I would say uh, close to like eight and a half years. Okay. Which means that for for every year you got to ball out and live the life, you had to spend four years in a cage. Yeah. Yep. When, when you when you think about that and, and the decisions that you made, and you know some young kid from Baltimore approaches you and says, "I want to be the next drug kingpin out of Baltimore. I want to be the next Rudy Williams." What would you tell him? I would tell them, you know, it's no money left in the drug world. The police make more money than... Uh, I would tell them, you know, it's, it's to go to entertainment. If, you, if you're smart, go where the money is. The money is in the entertainment. You got rappers out there, they're millionaires, a few of them billionaires, and they're living their life, and they don't have... They're actors, you know, they designers. I would tell them to go in there. Don't... Don't go into the uh, drug business. When you think about when you were at the height and, you know, you were moving heroin, you know, th through the streets of Baltimore. And when you think about now, years later, the destruction that it caused, the, the addicts, the, the murders, the broken families, the, the overdoses uh, and so forth. Do you, do you feel bad about it or do you feel like, well, if it wasn't you, someone else would have done it? No, I feel bad about it. Not real where it bothers me and hinder me or anything like that, but I, I feel bad about it. It was wrong. Yeah. Why, why do you think there's such a, a lure to do this type of business as opposed to go to college and, and do it the slower way? Because if you have young men, you know, uh, out on the streets, young black males that you find in prison, these are alpha males. These are alpha males. And all. They have to do something, you know, with, they have to take control, something they have to have some say in what they do. They're trying to take control of their own life. They're not trying to be imposed upon by society. They're not trying to be limited, you know. You be a carpenter, you be this. And they're, not, uh, they're not impressed with that. And then the time it takes, you know, the schedule, you know. They don't want to be doctors. They don't want to be doctors. is nobody in our world, you know. Lawyers are nobody. You know? The dude that with the power, with the swag, can get on the phone, make something happen, got the money, get the respect in the clubs, get the women and all that. That's what they want to be. You know. Society don't provide a way for them to get that in a legal way. A few of them, but not many of them. And they don't have time to wait on somebody else making it happen for them. You know, They feel like they can take it in their own hands and make it happen. They're not afraid of prison or death. They want to be men to potential. Same way with George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, uh, 
John Henry, and all the other founding fathers, they didn't want to be under King George. So they rebelled and they came over here and they made themselves the law. And they was criminals over there. They was outlaws, just like the kids in the streets and all that. So it's just the power to define, to use words to define other people and enforce it with arms and guns. Yeah, I mean, it's a great way of looking at it. I think even one of your interviews, you mentioned how, you know, John F. Kennedy, his whole family were criminals and bootleggers and essentially drug dealers of their day. That's right. And they they turned it into a presidency, you know, by painting it a certain type of way and getting the laws changed and so forth. Uh, history is ultimately written by the winners. That's true. And when you talk about drugs, you, you want to go back to the, uh, to the British the British uh, power, before it was empire, Queen, e Queen uh, uh, Elizabeth I, she, she almost single-handedly built the, uh, the drug trade with the opium. That's how she made it an empire, made it strong. You know? And they enforced that on the Chinese people, saying that it was, uh, they had a right to uh, exercise free trade. And they had the Boxers Rebellion. I think you might remember that. You wasn't there, but you read about it. You know? Yeah. And they uh, went to war with China because they had a right to sell their drugs in China. So when you're talking about the drug gangs out there, the gangs, the bloods, the crips, and all that, you got to put it in perspective. You got to remember Al Capone, Mal Lansky, you know, and they was getting their uh, rum to make the bootlegs out of Canada. And that was controlled by the queen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it gets deep. It gets deep on how you look at it. And, you know, now, now you know, there are people I know, like, like you know, Rollo, a rapper that I interviewed who's in jail right now over marijuana. And now in that same state of Georgia, marijuana is legal. It's actually becoming legal in every, in, in, you know, all around the country. That's true. Uh, while there's still people serving, you know, decades in prison over marijuana charges. It just all depends on the state of the world and what people like or don't like and, and so forth. It's like the Roaring Twenties and the bootlegging. Yep. Alcohol was illegal. I think it was uh, the 19th Amendment which was repealed maybe a year or two later, that outlawed alcohol. You had the bootleggers and people made fortunes. Kennedy, again, one of them, and the Bronzeman family. Right, yeah. Prohibition lasted from 1920 to 1933. So in those 13 and years, they like, fortunes were, were made. And yeah. they repealed it because yep. they couldn't outlaw, you know, people's uh, thirst for alcohol. Yep. Same way with drugs. You can't outlaw it. There you have it. Well, uh, Rudy Williams, I appreciate you, appreciate you coming in and telling your story. Uh, you know, you did 31 years in prison. You, you paid your debt to society. You have the right to talk about your story. Um, and I think it's very much a story that a lot of people could, could learn from because a lot of times when you watch shows like The Wire, like the drug dealer is romanticized and, you know, put on a pedestal and and so forth. When the reality is, is that it, it comes with a lot of suffering. It comes with a lot of lost time. It comes with a lot of prison. It comes with a lot of death. Um, and, you know, very rarely do you see people riding off into the sunset as a million, multi-million dollar drug dealer and, and go set up shop on an island somewhere. Usually the story is somewhat similar to yours. Unless you work for the CIA, you, you're Oliver North or somebody, you know. Right. Those are the ones who actually make all the money in drugs and, and get to become president right. of the NRA later on. And, That's true. And get high paid speaking positions and so forth. You're right. You got to be on the side of the government to make the real money. Otherwise, you end up dead in or in prison. In prison, like me. Or dead in the graveyard, like so many other brothers. You know? Actually, society keep it going, you know, through the movies. Every decade, they got a new movies. It, when I was in the 80s, it was Scarface. Then in the 90s, uh, New Jack City, Dino Brown. You know, 
dance uh, uh, El Chapo, Escobar, and all. Yeah, yeah. We had Paid in Full, you know, which with Alpo and, and, and Rich Porter and that True. whole story. Now you have B, the BMF story is now the most popular drug dealer story. And, and BMF is being romanticized. Crime is entertainment, uh, yeah. you know. America loves yeah, criminals. Always has you been. Know? They, gangster yep. groupies and shit. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Rudy Williams, I appreciate you coming in and telling your story. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Blair. Take care. You Peace. Too.